Today is Father's Day, a celebration that often takes a back seat to Mother's Day. This morning, however, we hope to change that, for in the Bible, the Father plays an equally, if not more important role than mothers in the family. So let me start off by greeting all the dads out there a happy Father's Day. Special shout out to my own dad. Thank you, fathers, for everything that you do for us. We love and appreciate you, and we are so glad to celebrate you today. Some of you may have wonderful memories of your dad. For others, yours may be an indifferent, distant, absent, or even abusive father. If you did not have a good dad, our Heavenly Father can be and wants to be the best father to you. Let us be reminded that there are no perfect earthly fathers, but there is a perfect Heavenly Father. And it is through the love of our earthly father that we get a glimpse into how much our Heavenly Father loves us. So to begin, let us join our worship leader in singing How Deep the Father's Love for Us as a way of celebrating our fathers and above all, our Father in Heaven.
I would like to emulate a kind attitude from my dad uh, and also his willingness of talking to us, checking up on us, uh, and also um, caring for us even when times are hard. And that's what I appreciate about my dad. And happy Father's Day. We grew up spending most of it every day with Papa, be it at home or in school. I saw him as a quick thinker and he has the ability to quickly make strategies for problems that need solutions at home, in cars, in anything. He would always remind us to never turn away from the Lord, to serve him and always thank God for all he has blessed us with. Happy Father's Day! I would like to do things wholeheartedly like my dad. He loves wholeheartedly and you can see it in his face especially when he's with children. You can see how simply happy he can be, just like how God can be simply happy with his creation. I would also like to be like him when I become older, still learning and reading God's word almost every day and putting God's word first in his life. Happy Father's Day, Papa. I'd like to emulate Dad's um, firmness in serving the Lord. I remember before, Dad always used to rush the entire family when we would go to church because for him, being late is unacceptable for the Lord. So it's funny because even now, this past year at home, um, he has made sure that every Sunday is set apart for the Lord. Um, and no matter what, we would attend church as a family every Sunday morning together. So thank you, Dad. Happy Father's Day to you and happy Father's Day to all the dads out there. I admire my dad for his simplicity, for his selflessness, and his generosity. He always puts others first, he rarely spends on himself, and he loves giving not just things, but especially his time and his acts of service. And most importantly, I admire his deep love for the Lord. Uh, I see this whenever he's passionate in sharing the gospel to anyone he interacts with. Even during the lockdown, he shared the gospel to the people fixing their gate. So I hope you follow his example. Pa, happy Father's Day, I love you. And to all the dads out there, my husband, my father-in-law, happy Father's Day. They say that I look a lot like my dad. He is my kakampi or ally, especially at home. He has a great sense of humor and can easily make anyone laugh. Like our godly father, he demonstrates forgiveness. My dad is razor sharp, even with his low vision condition. He acts and looks normal like everybody else. He is our source of strength and encouragement. Any man can be a father, but it takes someone special like him to be that. They say that fathers and daughters have a special bond. And yes, I'll always be a daddy's girl. To my first love, my coach, my dad, happy Father's Day. We love you. Once again, a happy Father's Day to all the dads watching this. Thank you to our worship leader, Sister Bev, for that wonderful song. Thank you also to all those children who shared their video greetings to some of the dads in our church family. Our theme for this year is Discipling the Nations, Finishing the Mission. Now, how does discipleship look like in the family, in the home? What role does a father have in discipling his children as he meets their real needs? I believe the best person to answer those questions is someone who is a real-life father. With four kids of his own, our guest speaker for today is more than qualified as he really knows what it means to be a father. I believe we will all be blessed by his message and his testimony, so let us now welcome my dear friend and brother in Christ, Pastor Don Manalese. 
A blessed morning, everyone. On behalf of Crossroads Ministries, I'd like to start off by thanking your church and your leadership for your continuous partnership in the ministry. Your prayers and support have been instrumental as we minister to people in our church planting ministry. Now, it has been more than a year since I've had the privilege of speaking in front of you. And since that time, I'm sure you are all agree that many things have changed. The fact that I'm giving this message online instead of on-site just shows us that a lot of things are not what they used to be. But still, one thing remains the same. And that is the truth that our God never changes. Whatever season of life we may be in, we can always be confident that He is dependable and we can always trust Him. And as we celebrate Father's Day today, it's good to be reminded how our Heavenly Father is still the best example of what fatherhood is all about. With that said, allow me now to greet each dad listening to this message a blessed Father's Day. Indeed, we cannot emphasize enough how vital fathers are to every household. Fathers have the God-given responsibility to lead and protect the family. And being a dad myself, I can think of a more challenging role than that of being a father to my kids. Now, speaking of my kids, let me share a recent photo of my children. As you can see, I have four adorable kids. And next to Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit, I consider my family as God's most precious gift. And like any normal dad, I am committed to do everything I can to serve my family, even if it entails hard work and sacrifice. This reminds me of what happened one hot summer night just a few weeks ago. It was around 11 p.m. and I was in front of my computer preparing for this particular sermon when the electricity in our house suddenly went out. Upon verification, we eventually found out that there was a scheduled 5-hour power interruption in our area caused by some maintenance work. This means that we won't have electricity until 4 a.m. Now, normally, this shouldn't be a big deal. Anyway, it's already late in the evening and most people can just sleep the night away. But as you all know, the summer heat last month was quite intense. Even with all our windows already open and all our kids were asleep, they were profusely sweating and were having a hard time sleeping. And so I did what any normal dad would do. I started to fan my kids to sleep. Pinaypayan ko sila para lang makatulog sila ng maayos. Since we weren't prepared for the brownout, I just used two hardened placemats that looked like this and used them to fan my kids. Now for the first 15 minutes, okay lang naman. It was fine. The idea seemed to work and the kids didn't wake up. After 30 minutes, my shirt was already soaked in sweat. After an hour of fanning, I was already begging God for a miracle. Whether it's in the form of the electricity immediately coming back, or a cool summer breeze for the rest of the evening, or supernatural strength na lang nga so I can sustain what I'm doing until 4 a.m. By God's grace, the electricity finally came back around 2 a.m. and we all could finally enjoy a good night's sleep. Now, obviously, my 3-hour experience the other night with our kids is just a minute sample size of what fathers do for their families. After all, fathers have the God-given responsibility to serve their families. The desire to provide for the needs of our kids are deeply ingrained in us. We constantly think of how to ensure the best future for our kids, especially during this pandemic. Which got me wondering, are we really doing enough as fathers to provide for the real needs of our kids? I mean, are we doing everything we can to prepare them for the future? You and I know that life is really short. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if each of us here knows of someone who recently passed away due to COVID-19. Like it or not, life can be taken from us at any moment. Have we done enough to prepare our kids for the future? Now, are we doing everything we can to provide for their 
real needs. Now, I do have to clarify that when I say real needs, I'm not just referring to the physical needs of our kids. While those are definitely important, we need to remember that our kids have way bigger needs. You see, the most important needs of our kids have to do with their spiritual needs. As fathers, it is our responsibility to do everything we can to ensure that our children have the best future in front of them. And this goes way beyond desiring a great education, promising career, or a comfortable life for our kids. I'm talking about doing everything in our ability to make sure that our kids spend eternity with Jesus and enjoy Him forever. I'm talking about doing everything humanly possible so that our kids make Jesus their number one priority and their highest treasure. Because at the end of the day, all the achievements and treasures of the world would count for nothing if our children fail to make Jesus as the true center of their lives. All the achievements and treasures of the world would amount to nothing if our kids don't have Jesus in their lives. Unfortunately, many of us fail to realize how crucial the role of the father is in the family and in meeting the kids' greatest needs. In 1994, there was a study made to assess whether a person's fate carried through the next generation. And the result was extremely revealing. The results show that even with or without the mother's devotion, it is really the father's fate that has more impact on their kids. Apparently, if the dad takes faith in God seriously, then the message to their children is that God should be taken seriously. This confirms the essential role of the father as the spiritual leader of the family. Now, at this point, you might be wondering, how exactly can fathers fulfill this role of leading the family spiritually? Especially now that we are unable to go to church. Hindi naman tayo nakapunta ng simbahan, di ba? Enough na ba if our kids see their fathers watch the live stream of our church's weekly church service? Or are there other things expected from dads to ensure that our kids grow up in the fear and love of our God? And if there are, what are these? And given that fathers already have a lot on their plate, like earning a living for the family, how exactly will they be able to meet these expectations? In the event that you forget the rest of what I say today, I hope you can remember this simple phrase. To meet our kids' greatest needs, we need to start discipling our kids. Can we all say that together? To meet our children's greatest needs, we need to start discipling our kids. Oh, just to make sure that we have an alignment on what discipling means, it's good to have a working definition. Basically, discipling is the process of helping others become truly committed followers of God. And so, discipling our kids is to help them truly know, truly love, and truly obey God. Now, I know I've been specifically addressing the fathers this morning. However, this doesn't mean that the rest of you who aren't dads are free to take a break and pause this video. Truth is, our message today applies to all parents, grandparents, single parents, and future parents. And for all the ladies, it's also crucial that you give the proper support to the men in your household in fulfilling their God-given mandate and calling. You see, as one church, it's crucial that we understand God's original design on how to ensure that our future generations will continue to walk with Him. To meet our children's greatest needs, we need to start discipling our kids. The greatest needs of our kids are their spiritual needs. Why don't we all read our passage for this morning found in Deuteronomy 6 verses 4 to 9. Let's read this together. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house 
and on your gates. Now, this is probably the most popular Bible passage for Jews. You see, for the Jews, they know this as the Shema. Shema is the Hebrew word for hear, which obviously is the first word in verse 4. For the Jews, the Shema is regarded as the most important prayer in their faith and were prayed multiple times a day. Now, obviously, we are not Jews and nowhere in the Bible are believers required to pray a certain type of prayer repeatedly. But it's good to understand what's important about these verses and how these timeless truths are also applicable to believers today. You see, the book of Deuteronomy is like one long sermon given by the prophet Moses before his death. The group of people Moses was speaking to in Deuteronomy is not the same group of adults that came out of Egypt. The previous generation of Israelites repeatedly dishonored and disobeyed God. And as a consequence of their hard-heartedness, the entire generation who listened to the ten spies was made to wander around the desert for 40 long years. And except for Joshua and Caleb, the only two men who listened to God, that entire generation was forbidden to enter the promised land and died in the wilderness. By the time Moses gave this sermon in Deuteronomy, he was speaking to a new generation of Israelites. And Moses' earnest plea was for God's people to make sure that they do it right this time. And doing it right this time means making disciples of the next generation a priority. The same thing is true for us today. If we are to make things right this time, we need to prioritize discipling the next generation. Which leads us back to our question earlier. How exactly do we disciple the next generation? Well, in order to disciple the next generation, discipleship must start with us. Discipleship must start with us. Let's read again Deuteronomy 6 verses 4 to 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. At the risk of sounding like a broken record, let me ask you once more, who was Moses talking to in this passage? Moses was speaking to the next generation of Israelites, but they were no longer kids. They were a new generation of adults who have their own kids. In short, Moses was talking to a group of parents and his instructions was for them to love the Lord their God with all their heart, soul, and strength. And I find that very interesting. You see, when people think of discipling the next generation, we normally start with a child. Our tendency is to focus on what needs to be done with our kids for them to grow spiritually. Like we think of ways so that our children will regularly attend Sunday school, go to the youth fellowship, attend church, or we focus on filtering the books they read, the movies they watch. We want them to manage their time wisely, not to waste their time on games, Facebook, and we want them to read the Bible. We want them to be part of a small group and we want them to display godly character. But when we start with the child, we are already beginning at the wrong place. Because discipleship all starts with our own relationship with God. That's our number one priority. And here's why. Because we cannot expect our children, our teenagers, our grandkids to do something that we ourselves are not modeling and living out. So discipleship actually starts with us parents. It starts with our own personal knowledge of God in our own personal walk with Him. Moses wanted the new generation of Hebrew parents to know this fact before they enter the promised land. If they are to fulfill God's purpose and ensure the next generation will walk closely with God, then it must start with them. And this is not just an Old Testament command that is reserved for Jews. Let's look at what Jesus has to say in Matthew 22 verses 35 to 38. Verse 35, And one of them, a lawyer, asked Jesus a question, testing him, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. 
Jesus, when asked what was the greatest command, he essentially repeated the words of Moses in Deuteronomy 6. All the commands in the Bible are summarized in this statement. Obey this one command, and everything else will be naturally obeyed. And to this day, all followers of Christ are expected to fulfill this command to love Him. Moses and Jesus were basically saying is that we should love God with our entire being. We are to devote to God all our affections, all our thoughts, all our energies, all our lives. The whole totality and not just a part of ourselves. We can't say we've obeyed this command if there is still a part of us that is not yet fully submitted to Him. Now, if that sounds like asking a lot, that's because it is a lot. All throughout scriptures, we're shown that God isn't after half-hearted followers. People who will honor Him only when they feel convenient or when it's comfortable. God wants fully committed followers who will give absolutely everything for Him. After all, He is worthy of just that. That's why Moses began verse 4 by declaring to God's people that the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You see, there's not one person or thing in this world that is anywhere near worthy of our full devotion except God. Pastor Don, if that's the case, then none of us can ever fulfill this command to love God with our all. Well, that is true. You see, by ourselves, we neither have the capacity nor the capability to 100% fulfill this command. No matter how hard we try, we will definitely fail in loving God with our 100%. Hindi natin kaya yun eh. But that's where the gospel comes in. You see, God knows we can't do it on our own. That's why He sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to redeem us from our fallen nature. And the good news is, if you have truly placed your trust in Jesus Christ, God imputes the righteousness of Christ in you. And God credits Jesus' perfection in those who truly believe in Him. His Holy Spirit, who now resides in every believer, supernaturally enables us to love Him as we should. God not only showed us what is love. You see, His Holy Spirit also enables us to love Him back. And while it doesn't mean we'll be able to perfectly love God in this lifetime, we can take comfort that His Holy Spirit is perfecting us until we meet God face to face. Our role is to respond to God's nature and to His love by loving Him with our whole being. And as parents, loving God certainly involves our time, our talents, and our treasures. You see, we can't expect our kids to devote their time, talents, and treasure to the Lord if we ourselves are too busy for God, or too preoccupied to serve, or too focused on worldly things, not on the Lord. Especially now that many of us work from home, our kids can see almost everything we do. Wala tayong matatago eh. They see that we have time for work, for phone calls, for Facebook, for YouTube, for Netflix. But how often do they really see us spend time with the Lord? Do they see us read our Bibles from Mondays to Saturdays and not just on Sundays? Do we personally carve out time to really talk to God and commune with Him? Do we set aside our Sunday morning to actively participate in congregational worship? Or do our kids witness us looking bored and even multitasking whenever we worship online? At the same time, we have to ask ourselves, when was the last time our children witnessed us volunteer our abilities to help out in God's work? Do our kids see us more concerned in building our own empire instead of expanding God's kingdom? In terms of our finances, how exactly are we handling the money God has entrusted to us? Are we investing our fortune for personal gain? Or are we truly storing our treasures in heaven? If we are to disciple the next generation, we, as parents and adults, need to truly love God with our entire being. And this goes beyond being active in church. 
we can appear like a super Christian, but our kids know the real us. They can easily discern if we are sincere or being hypocritical. They see us in our homes, unguarded and unfiltered. They observe how we respond to everyday temptations, conflicts, and challenges of life. You see, our kids don't need a man-centered religiosity. What they need to see is our authentic relationship with God. One that yields fruits in our lives and one they would want for themselves. In order to disciple the next generation, discipleship must start with us. It must start with us because we can't give what we don't have. And as parents, our number one priority is to love God above all and with our all. But to disciple the next generation, discipleship must also start at home. Discipleship must also start at home. Now, here's a simple exercise for all of us. I have two questions for you and I'd like you to state your answer out loud. When it comes to educating your child about God, who is the first person that comes to mind? Next, when your child has a question about the Bible, who would your child likely go to for answers? If we're really honest, most of us would have mentioned the name of our pastor our kid's Sunday school teacher, or their small group leader. But if Moses was here with us today, he would tell us that the first person who should disciple our kids is not any of those persons. Instead, the ones primarily responsible to educate our kids about God's Word is actually us parents right at home. And this kind of home discipleship is not just to occur once in a blue moon. Look at verse 7. In verse 7, we see Moses telling the parents to teach their children diligently. Now, the word diligently emphasizes that we are to regularly and habitually teach our kids God's word. And Moses shows parents how to do this. When you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, and when you lie down and when you rise up. This means that the discipling of our kids does not only happen formally, but should also be practiced informally. This involves spontaneous learning, where everyday life situations are the place for the most powerful learning. A few years ago, I was in our bedroom when our kids asked permission if they can watch the highlights of a beauty pageant. And while they watched the video clip, I overheard how a certain candidate was being celebrated for being a transgender. And my first instinct was to make them skip that part of the show, hoping that they didn't absorb any unwanted information. But as I reflected on the matter, I believe God wanted to use that opportunity as a teaching moment for our girls. And so... I asked them to pause the video for a while and I discussed with them God's design in terms of human sexuality. Now, that evening turned out to be one of the best family times for us as it opened a lot of spontaneous learning and discussion of important truths from man's sin and rebellious heart to the biblical response towards LGBTs. Our girls not only embraced their femininity but also committed to filter what they see and hear through the lens of the scriptures. You see, discipling our kids is really a 24-7 calling and privilege. Just teach them through formal lessons and studies, but in everyday life situations, wherever and whenever. Now that we all can't go out as much, we really have no excuse not to teach our kids the Word of God. You see, we are so used to outsourcing things. If we want our kids to learn the piano, we send them to a piano class. If we want them to be good in math, we get the services of a math tutor. Now, the problem with that model is we can't outsource the discipling of our kids 
to another person. God has placed on the shoulders of the parents to teach their kids God's word. A good church ought to be a stimulus but not a substitute for home training. Think about this. How many hours in a week do our kids really spend at church? Or in Sunday school? Or in their fellowship and small group? Now compare that to how many hours they spend with us at home. Which do you think have more influence? What they hear from an hour in church? Or what they hear from us from the rest of the week? For the teaching and training of our children, to be incredibly fruitful. It must be sourced from dad and then mom. Now, I'm very blessed with a wife who is both capable and competent with many things. And one of her strengths is in the area of teaching. Not only is she a gifted teacher, Tiff is actually a trained and licensed educator. She has had years of professional experience in the teaching field, and she's really good at it. In fact, even now when most kids study at home, she continues to get uh, invited to teach other kids online. However, when it comes to teaching and training our own kids about God's truths, everyone in our household knows that I take that lead. Not because I'm a pastor or I'm more skilled in teaching kids, but because as the father of the household, God has appointed me as the main discipler of our family. My kids are my small group members. Look at what the Apostle Paul has to say about the role of dads in Ephesians 6 verse 4. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Fathers, God has given us the primary role of discipling our kids. Our wives may be our assistant small group leaders and she can be of help, but we can never abdicate on our role as the spiritual leader of the family. We should neither outsource nor delegate our duty of bringing up our kids in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. For us to discuss the Word of God with our children, we must, of course, first know the Scriptures. And we can only know them by first consuming them. This is why Moses tells the Israelites in verse 8, You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on your doorposts and on your gates. Now, some Jews have and still do, take these verses literally. They have little boxes containing Old Testament verses attached to their door frames and or fastened to their arms or foreheads. But God's intent in this passage was symbolic. He intended for his audience to hear the scripture and see the scripture lived out everywhere. Moses was essentially saying, Do whatever you need to keep God's word in your mind and heart. From the most personal aspect of your bedroom doors to the most public aspect of your community life, God's commands should become the habit of everyday life. You see, the goal is not simply for us and our family to read the Bible regularly. The goal is to be fully saturated with God's word. Truth is, as I look back at the past year and a half, there were a lot of wonderful things that transpired inside our home in spite of the pandemic. For starters, my wife and I had exponentially more time with our kids. While we always had time for and with them before, the new work-from-home arrangement allowed us to be physically together with our kids for majority of the time. And because we are mostly at home, the kids have a better idea on how our day really goes. And it all starts with my personal quiet time in the morning. I would begin each day communing with God through prayer and the study of His Word. 
Now, this photo was taken last year when my then six-year-old daughter saw me reading my Bible and asked how she can also start the habit of having a personal time with the Lord. You see, we've always read Bible stories with her from her kiddie Bible. But after seeing me and her two older sisters read our big Bibles every morning, she began to have an appetite to read the not so kitty Bible as well. Since then, she has faithfully devoured God's Word and shares her daily learnings with us. And I pray that God's Word will continue to work in her heart and in her life. Now, as to her twin sisters, they already established this habit a few years ago. In fact, in the past three years, they have read the entire Bible twice and are now about to complete their third round soon. What's interesting is, just like their Shobe, I can't remember ever asking them to read their Bible or finish it in a year. But since they see and know that I read it every day and they know that I go through the entire Bible once every year, My wife tells me that they imitate my example in this area. Last year, God also gave me the privilege to teach both of them how to journal their learnings. And since then, they've been faithfully journaling their insights from God's Word. Now, I do have a two-year-old boy, and obviously, he still can't read. But what's funny is, he calls me each day, and asks me to read his Bible with him. You see, he sees everyone reading the Bible, and I believe he can't wait to read for himself. Now, another highlight I have last year was when God allowed me to initiate our family sharing time. Uh, Think of it as a small group meeting, but we gather every night during dinner. We each have a turn sharing our Thanksgiving items for the day, the since we committed, what we appreciate about each other, and what we learned from the Bible that day. Afterwards, the family member in charge for the day would read a devotional story, and then we'd process the lesson together and recite the key verse for that day. Lately, we've also been using an app called Operation World, where we learn about how we can pray for different countries and their needs. We wrap things up by singing a worship song together and assigning a person to pray for all the prayer items that day. Now, our prayer items can come in all shapes and sizes, from our country and government needs to family members and relatives, people who are sick, uh, struggling, our personal concerns, my preaching responsibilities, the ministry we started, Lahat, lahat na. The nice thing about this is that we all look forward to this part of the day, including the kids. Hindi sila pilit. Our day isn't complete when we don't have this bonding time. In order to disciple the next generation, discipleship must start with us. Because we can't give what we don't have. As parents, our number one priority is to love God above all and with our all. But to disciple the next generation, discipleship must also start at home. We can't outsource and delegate the Christian education of our kids. As parents, we have the primary responsibility to train our children in God's Word. My prayer is that when our kids need to clarify matters about the faith, the first person they will think of is their parents, especially us fathers. I pray that we will model a genuine and wholehearted love for God that they themselves would want to have. I pray that we develop the habit of intentionally and diligently teaching them God's truths. After all, all the achievements and treasures of this world will count for nothing if our children fail to put Jesus at the center of their lives. As fathers, 
we have the God-given responsibility to provide for our kids' greatest needs. And the greatest needs of our kids are their spiritual needs. To meet our children's greatest needs, we need to start discipling our kids. Starting with us and starting at home. Happy Father's Day. Thank you, Pastor Don, for sharing your fatherhood experiences with us. Thank you also to our cherubim kids for that beautiful song in honor of all our fathers. Right now, we will take some time to pray a prayer of blessing over the dads in our church family, as well as all the dads who are watching this right now. If you are currently a father, a grandfather, or a spiritual father to someone, or you desire to be a father someday, we would like to pray for you. For those who are with your dad right now, or there is a father in your home, I want you to surround the fathers in your family. You can extend or lay your hands over them as we pray. To my father, without whom I will not be who I am today, I love you. Thank you for all your sacrifice. To all my spiritual fathers, Thank you for being my role model and for surrounding me with your prayers and with your advice. Shall we pray? On this special day that we get to celebrate the love of fathers, what a comforting thought it is to know that the God of all the universe is also our Heavenly Father. A Father who is good, a Father who has our best interest in mind. A Father who knows our name, who knows 
the number of strand of hair that falls from our head. A Father who holds us in the palm of His hands. An Abba Father who knows our every thought, fulfills our every need, understands our every struggle, assures us in our every fear, identifies with us in our every sorrow, and celebrates with us in our every victory. A Father who knows every pain that we go through, every sorrow that we bear, every tear that we shed, every brokenness that we suffer. And what is amazing is that you do not only know, you understand, because you have walked among us and you have gone through every emotion that we have gone through. You know everything and yet you still love us as our Father. And you did something. You gave your one and only Son, Jesus Christ, so that we might become your sons and daughters. We give our thanks, Creator God, for the fathers in our lives. Thank you for the unique calling you have given to them to allow us to see what your love looks like in our world. We ask for your blessings upon every father this morning. I pray that each father would step up boldly into the anointing that you have called them to. May you help them fulfill their God-ordained position of leadership as head of their family. May they rise up courageously to lead their wives and their children into a deeper spiritual knowledge and understanding of their Savior and Lord Jesus Christ. We ask for wisdom for them in raising up godly children. Give them the strength also to do so. We thank you for faithful husbands and fathers in our midst. This Father's Day, we remember the many sacrifices they made for their children and for their families, and the ways, both big and small, that they do to lift their children to achieve their dreams. We also remember those who have helped fill the void when fathers pass on early or are absent. Grandfathers, uncles, brothers and cousins, teachers, pastors, and spiritual fathers, Gracious Abba, we approach your throne on behalf of each of the fathers who is watching this video. For fathers who are tired, discouraged, troubled by new challenges brought about by this pandemic, just as you have heard the prayers of fathers before, would you like, would you please hear them again today? We remember those who are in pain. I pray for those whose dads are no longer with us or for those fathers who are weak, may you release healing and comfort upon them. For those faithful fathers who are raising their children in your footsteps, we ask for strength and wisdom in the task of parenting and discipling their kids. Give new and future fathers the guidance they need to raise godly children. May each father be granted your special blessing and favor for the many times they reflected the love, strength, generosity, wisdom, and mercy that you, that you exemplify in your relationship with us, your children. May all of the work of their hands not be forgotten in your sight. May each father know that he is loved by their heavenly father just as they are, not because of what they have accomplished or did not accomplish, or if they are successful as a father or not, but that you love them in spite of this. And with this knowledge of your love, may they feel empowered to love their children the same way. We need fathers who point us to Jesus Christ like no one else will. Fathers who will teach us to honor you, remind us to obey your commands, challenge us to do your good works, model for us how to walk in a godly way. Father, I pray that you will begin a revival in the families of this church and in this nation through the leadership of our fathers in the home today. We pray for each child with a father. May you humble us that we would learn to respect and to love our fathers like you desired. Help us to surround them with gratefulness. Grant that we may honor our father always. And by honoring them, we are also honoring you. And may we honor them while we still can, for we never know 
how long we will have that opportunity. This is our prayer in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and all of God's people say, Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us in celebrating our Heavenly Father as well as our earthly fathers today. If you wish to know more about New Millennium Evangelical Church or how you can give to support God's kingdom work through us, kindly visit our Facebook page for more details. Let us now receive the benediction. May the Lord bless and keep you. May His face continue to shine upon you and may He be gracious to you. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of the Father, and the comfort and encouragement of the Holy Spirit be upon us all. Have a blessed day to all our fathers. Remember, the best is yet to come. Thank you.